Oh, hello, class. Uh, today we're going to talk about oligopolies. So an oligopoly is a market structure in which you have a small number of interdependent, very, very large companies. The best examples of oligopolies are things like car manufacturers, um, Ford, General Motors, Chrysler, Tesla, Toyota, Nissan, or uh, wireless carriers, for example, like AT&T and Verizon, or internet service providers, where you have very few options and the companies are very large. Oligopolies usually exist due to these barriers of entry, so it becomes very difficult for other people to join the market at any point in time, and that creates a sort of oligopolistic um, environment. Now, to show you a bit of an example, I have this picture. So, what you're seeing here on the sort of outside of this picture, it's about 90% of the brands that you can buy when you go to your supermarket. And then what you see in the middle of the picture is basically the about 10 companies or so that produce that product behind the scenes under all these different names. So for example, um, let's go to the uh, aisle where you purchase things to, um, to wash your clothes. Um, so if you buy Dawn, Tide, Bounce, Gain, Cheer, Cascade, Downey, Ivory, or Joy, they're all being produced by Procter & Gamble. If you buy <clears throat> Febreze, Suifer, Puffs, Bounty, all of them again are being provided by Procter & Gamble. If you come up here to um, PepsiCo, for example, uh, PepsiCo owns Quaker. Uh, they're also a large owner of uh, pizza chains like Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, and KFC. If you look up here, um, in the bubblegum area, for example, Tree Den, Five Gum, Excel, Ringley's, Double Mint, Big Red, Fruit Juice, Extra, Orbit, and Hubba Bubba, they're all being made by the same company. Um, so in this case, Ringley, which is owned by Mars. Um, if you're looking, for example, here for Kellogg's, Corn Flake, Fruit Loops, Pops, Rice Krispies, Kellogg's, Frosted Flakes, Mini Wheats, All Brain Crave, Racing Brand, and Apple Jacks are all being made by the same company, in this case, Kellogg's. So these companies, which again, if you count them, is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten or so, they um, produce pretty much all this stuff you see around. And these are what oligopolies are. So when you engage in the front of this market, aka the retail industry, like when you go to Walmart, when you go to Target, or when you go to Publix, or when you go to um, Fresco, or whatever the name of the supermarket is, you would notice all these other brands being sold out there, but they're being sold by these people. Um, I challenge you to go into the, uh, into the cereal aisle, for example, and look at the back of the boxes so you can see who really makes them. Um, and it's usually on that label, um, sort of like telling you the address of the place where this is being produced. All right, so again, this is what oligopolies are. Now, what exactly are these barriers of entry? Well, the biggest barrier of entry is something called economies of scale. And uh, economies of scale is basically a situation in which a firm um, Loan run average cost falls as it increases output. So when these companies basically go beyond a certain particular size, it's really difficult for other people to enter the market and compete with them because these companies are so huge and the cost of production is so small. Another one could be the ownership of an input. So it's when a company basically owns a particular input and as a, um, as a consequence of that, they control a particular uh, sector simply because they are the owners of, say, diamond mines or um, oil production because they own all the fields or aluminum mines, for example. Another reason that can create an oligopoly is basically a government imposed barrier like a patent or a copyright or some kind of special license 
that the government provides to a particular producer and to no one else. <clears throat> now this is a um, this right here is a sort of picture of some of the things that are oligopolies. And one way to know whether something is an oligopolis, and that's usually a test question, is the four firm concentration ratio. The four firm concentration ratio is basically when you take the top four companies in the industry and you add their sales percentage. So you take their total sales as a percentage of the industry and you add it. Um, what this is basically saying here when it says warehouse clubs and super centers, what it's saying is that 92% of all sales of warehouse clubs and super centers are being done by four companies. And that's sort of what an oligopoly is. If you come up here, for example, to the cigarette market, 95% of all the sales in the industry are being done by the top four cigarette producers. Same here with beer. Uh, same here with breakfast cereal and so on. Um, <clears throat> the best way to study oligopolies is by doing uh, something called game theory. And game theory is a study of how people make decisions in situations in which attaining their goals depend on the interactions with others. Now, all games have three basic characteristics. They have rules, strategies, and payoffs. So let's talk a little bit about um, the way you kind of look at game theory. So the idea on game theory is that we want to get to a particular outcome. So this is where we want to go. Now, we don't follow any normal rules in here in game theory. You sort of kind of like make up a particular game every time you want to get to a particular outcome. So you are here and you want to reach a particular outcome. So you follow a pattern based on what is best for you. So all games have rules, strategies, and payoffs. So you start at the end on the game in a very basic way because you want to start with where do I want to end okay so I want my payoff to be something now you're standing here and you need to understand the sort of rules of the game so what are the realities in society what am I allowed to do what am I not allowed to do what's legal what's illegal what are the expectations by other people? And then you basically develop your strategy based on that. And that's really what game theory is about. So you don't start with a particular set of strategies already and you kind of execute them. You sort of start down here where you go, okay, this is where I want to go. And then you go over here and say, okay, well, what are the rules of the game? And then you develop your strategy based on that. All right, so here's a video that might be useful in understanding game theory. Coming, gentlemen. Adam's 
swiftly to revision. What are you talking about? We all go to the pond. We block each other. Not a single one of us is going to get him. So then we go for our friends. They will all give us the cold shoulder because nobody likes to be sick. No one goes for the blood. We don't get in each other's way. And we don't stop the other girls. It's the only way to win. That's the only way we all get laid. That was best said. Best result comes from everyone in the group doing what's best for themselves, right? That's what he said. Because the best was home come from everyone in the group doing what's best for himself. And the group. Ash, this is some way for you to get the blood on your own. You can go to hell. Go to Don Adams, gentlemen. Go to Don Adams. Adam Smith. What's wrong? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So again, the creator of um, or the sort of uh, the, the economist that created the majority of game theory. His name was John Nash. He passed away a few years ago, and um, he was the one who sort of introduced us to this new way of thinking that you see in that particular video. <clears throat> All right. So there are multiple ways to usually explain game theory. Um, um, we, we normally have three basic games that we play when we're introducing game theory. So the first game that we like to play in game theory is something called a payoff matrix. Uh, the payoff matrix is basically a table showing the payoffs for each firm earning from every combination of strategies. So let's play the payoff matrix. <clears throat> All right, now imagine a situation where you have two companies. Now let's say that these two companies are Target at the top and Walmart on the side. Now imagine that <clears throat> Target and Walmart are trying to figure out how much money they're going to be charging you for a flat panel TV. Now let's say that this TV, if you go to Target, could cost you $600, or if you go to Walmart, it could cost you $600. Now that what you see in the middle is the payoff by the company. So if Walmart and Target keep their prices both at 600, then the payoff for both companies is going to be 10,000 for Walmart, 10,000 for Target. Now, but what happens if one of the companies decides that they're going to lower the price? Now imagine Target lowers the price, but Walmart maintains its price at 600. If that happens, then Target is going to have an advantage because they will be charging lower prices for the product, and then they will have a larger amount of traffic of customers into their stores. As a consequence of that, Target is going to be making more money. So as you can see, their profit payout goes up. And by the same time, Walmart is going to be making less money when they lose traffic to Target. But of course, Walmart and Target don't operate in a vacuum. They're both very large companies, so they can both compete. As a consequence of that, imagine that Walmart decides that they're going to do it first instead. And again, this is a sort of characteristic of game theory that you don't operate in a vacuum picking whatever profit maximization quantity you want. You sort of operate in, a, in an environment where everyone makes a particular decision and then now you have to react to their decision. So imagine that Target may, uh, decides to keep the price at 600 and then it's Walmart, the one that drops the price to 400. Notice that if Walmart is the one that drops the price to 400, but Target keeps it at 600, then the one that makes the money is Walmart, and the one that loses the money is Target. Now, a more likely outcome um, is what we call a price war. A price war is basically when all the companies decide that they're going to drop the price at the same time, and that's sort of what John Nash was explaining. And we have this option here. Now, this option here is when you see that Target is charging 400 and Walmart is charging 400, so we end up in this point here. 
Now notice at this point here, they're both making equal profits, but they're equally lower compared to this point of 600 up here. All right, so let's talk about what we call a dominant strategy. All right, so let's take a look at uh, Target's strategy. Now notice that Target has the ability to basically charge 400 or they can charge 600. Now what they're gonna do depends on what Walmart chooses. Now imagine that Walmart stays at 600 and think about which one will be a better strategy for Target. Now notice that Target has two outcomes, either 10,000 or 15,000. Notice how the 15,000 outcome is larger than the 10,000 outcome. So Target, given the choice of Walmart charging 600, it's gonna to go to the right side and drop the price to 400. Now notice also that if Walmart decides that they're gonna drop the price to 400, look at the two choices for Target, again, choices being right or left, then Target can pick either 7,500 or 5,000, and notice that the 7,500 is larger than the 5,000. So given any choice by Walmart, notice that Target will pick the 400 price level. When that is true, when Target will always pick the right side versus the left side, that's what we call a dominant strategy. And Target now has a dominant strategy. They need to cut the price to 400. Now let's take a look at Walmart's choices. Let's pick a different color here for Walmart. So Walmart has the ability to sort of go up in this, or they could go down. Now they would choose depending on what target picks. So imagine the target stays at 600, then Walmart has a choice of going up or going down. Notice how the down strategy is more than the up strategy of 10,000. That's giving the choice that target selects 600. Now, if Target decides to select 400 as their price instead, then notice how Walmart again can pick to go up or down, and notice how down is still a better strategy than up because this number 7,500 is larger than this number 5,000. So Walmart also has a dominant strategy where they're going to go on the down strategy or 400 regardless of what target does. So they also have a dominant strategy. Now notice that by following their dominant strategy, they both end up in this, and this is what we call equilibrium in this, in this case. So this is the equilibrium. Uh, more specifically, this is a Nash equilibrium. Now notice that the Nash equilibrium is not really a good equilibrium. As a matter of fact, it's a sort of bad equilibrium where they both end up at a lower profit level. And this is why we teach this kind of stuff in business school because basically what John Nash was explaining um, and some of it is explained in the video is if everybody follows what they normally see as their dominant strategy, we, everybody is basically worse off. So we're better off coming up with a different strategy and then basically trying to stay up here. So this is a sort of business strategy instead. So this is the one you want to have. You know, we want to figure out how to end up up here. And the best way to end up up here is by basically colluding. In other words, by both of us deciding that we are not going to do what we normally do, which is just to go into a price war, we are both going to get together and charge 600, and then we're just gonna leave it there. And that's basically what Oligopoly um, tries to explain. Now, if this particular game was given to you, by the way, to solve, then you would have to follow this right or left strategy. All right, this is another example of a payoff matrix. So let's see how we're gonna be solving this one. All right, let's use uh, different colors for people at the top, so I'm going to use black. All right, so imagine that you're white and you're trying to figure out which strategy to pick. Now, a higher number here basically means you, you get paid more money. So if you're white, basically, 
and yellow uses low as their strategy, then your payout is going to be either right or left. Those are your two basic choices. Now notice that in this case, 160 is larger than 120. So given the choice of low by yellow, you're going to select 160 as your strategy because 160 is higher than 120. Now, if you're white, given the choice of high by yellow, notice that you are going to select 100 because 100 is higher than 50 and you have the choices of right or left because you're at the top of the matrix. Now, if you're on the side of the matrix, like yellow is, then yellow has the ability to go low or high. Notice that high, which is down here in this case, is 160 and that is higher than 120. So given a choice of this by white, then yellow will select this number because this 160 is greater than this 120. Now, if given a choice by white or high, then yellow will also pick again either high, the number on the top or the number on the bottom. So the people on the side of the matrix will go either top or bottom. The person on the top of the matrix is going to go right or left. So if you're yellow and you can pick top or bottom, you're going to pick bottom here because bottom is better than top, which is 50. And you end up in this equilibrium. Now, the equilibrium doesn't always have to be here, by the way. Equilibrium could be on any of these four. And that's actually one of the points of game theory is that you don't have a sort of set strategy. Uh, there are multiple strategies that could happen at any time. All right, so let's sort of move on with our hard point. So the best agreement really is what we call collusion. And collusion is an agreement when everybody sort of gets together and decides that they're going to be charging the same price. A really good example of this is OPEC. Um, OPEC stands for the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. And it's basically a, um, a, an oil cartel that organizes itself outside of the United States in places in the world where this is perfectly legal. Um, in the U.S., price fixing is illegal and price collusion is also illegal. Alright, now let's talk about a different game, uh, something called a prisoner's dilemma. In a prisoner's dilemma game, you have either a cooperative equilibrium or a non-cooperative equilibrium. So, Let's kind of uh, take a look at what a prisoner's dilemma looks like. Now, one of the simplest ways to explain a prisoner's dilemma is imagine that you have two people that did something wrong. Okay, now let's call the one guy, um, guy A, and let's call the second guy, guy B. Now, guy A and guy B have two basic choices. Uh, choice number one is they stay quiet and they do not cooperate with the police. So they kind of stay silent. Another choice is that they do talk to the police. Let's call it a rata. All right, so we'll, get, we'll call this choice Q and we'll call this choice R. Now, one option, if you play this game, is that both guys stay quiet. So guy A stays quiet, doesn't say anything. And then guy B stays quiet, doesn't say anything either. What this basically does is it makes the police figure out what happened. So now the police, the one that has to figure out what happened in the entire scene. They're not getting any information from any other two people involved. So it is kind of like their job now to, to figure out what happened. And um, this is sort of like the best outcome for the two guys that did something wrong. They both take quiet. But that's only one possibility. There's also the possibility that guy B stays quiet. 
but then guy A decides to talk. There's also the possibility that guy A stays quiet, but then guy B is the one that decides to talk. There is also the possibility that everyone talks. And those are the four basic probabilities for these events to happen. Now notice that 75% of the time, or three out of four different games, or four different possibilities, someone talks to someone, so the police is gonna have some information, and that is 75% of the time, we end up in a sort of non-cooperative equilibrium between the two people involved. You can think of this as being like a business price war or something like that. And then only 25% of the time, or one out of four, we end up in the sort of equilibrium that we want. And this is also, again, what we see out there. Uh, very few times companies can create this sort of collusion agreements like OPEC because it's very difficult to maintain these collusion agreements when anyone can cheat at any point in time. All right, so again, this is what we call the, the prisoner's dilemma. And a lot of companies have this prisoner's dilemma problem. If they go ahead and try to do what they're supposed to do in order to increase their profits, the other company can take advantage by basically undercutting them and then think about like blindsiding them with a lower price here. All right, so again, that's what we call a, an example of a prisoner's dilemma. And most of the time, you end up in what we call non-cooperative equilibrium. All right, now, how can companies escape this sort of prisoner's dilemma? Well, in the U.S., it's illegal to price fix, which will be the best choice if you're a company. Um, but what they do is they cooperate a lot of the times without saying anything. We call it implicit collusion or price leadership. Now, price leadership is a form of implicit collusion where one company or a firm announces a particular price, and then it is matched by everybody else. And this we see a lot in the industry. Um, you can think of um, a really good example is, is what you normally see in the phone market, especially the smartphone market, where you see the sort of best of the best charge a particular price. Let's call it, a, I don't know, $1,400 as an example. And then you see whoever's competing with the best, let's call it the second best. They're charging a price that's pretty similar to that. And then you see basically everybody else, let's call it, you know, third and fourth and fifth, sort of arranging themselves as a scale from that. Now, what happens in this particular game is that if the guy at the top one day wakes up and says, well, wait a minute, I can charge something higher. Let's call it 1700. Then what you're going to see as an answer from everybody else is second is going to move up their price as well to let's call it, I don't know, 1650. And then everyone else is going to organize themselves below that one but higher than before, as they now have the ability to do that. So this is a sort of form of implicit collusion where everyone's not agreeing on a particular price, but they are agreeing on a particular strategy. And that is that the best charge is the highest price and everybody charges slightly lower than that, depending on where you are on the scale. And that is a sort of implicit um, collusion agreement. All right, now let's talk about sort of the, the last game here in this. Uh, it's called a sequential game. Now, a sequential game is basically when companies have to sequentially get to where they want to go. So they start at a particular price, and then through a sequence of events, they end up um, somewhere else. So let's, um, let's go through a sequential game. All right, so let's go through the sequential game. So notice that in this case, we have Walmart. 
in Walmart can select to open a large store or a small one. And then we have a follow up by Target that's going to either enter or not enter. Now, to understand this one, think about Walmart as trying to figure out what's best for them, but making sure that they pick uh, something, assuming that Target is going to do something as well. So if Walmart goes and opens a large store, then notice that Target is going to able, be able to enter or not enter. Target is going to pick whatever is best for them. Notice that Target can can have a revenue return of 10 or a revenue return of zero. They will select to enter and get a revenue return of 10 because it's better than having a revenue return of zero. Now, imagine instead um, that Walmart goes and opens a small store. If they decide to open a small store, then Target can either enter or not enter. And notice that Target also gets either a return of 18 or a return of zero. And they're gonna pick a return of 18 because it's better for them to enter than not enter. Now, now we know what Target is going to do, assuming I go large or small. Now then Walmart makes a choice. They look at these two choices and go, okay, well, which one is better for me? And notice that 18 is better for Walmart than 10, assuming Target enters on both. So Walmart is going to select whatever is best for them. And this is the sort of end of the game. So we're going to go with a small store and then target is going to follow by entering and they both end up with 1818. Now, just like I was explaining though about sequential games or about game theory, um, one is not always the answer. We could have multiple equilibrium that would happen at any particular point in time. Now let's make a different assumption to see how this changes. Now let's say, that Target is a sort of greedy company. So Target likes to make sure that they have 12% return or more. If they don't get 12%, then they're just not going to participate because they don't think it's worth their time. Okay? So if that is the case, when I split this, then notice that if Walmart goes large, then Target can enter or not enter, but then the return is going to be either 10 or 0. 10 is not enough for Target to enter because it's below the threshold of 12. As a consequence of that, they're going to choose not to enter if presented with this choice. It's kind of like someone saying, oh, can you go cut the grass for me? And then you say, well, unless your grass is this big, I won't cut it because it takes too long for me to get there. So if somebody says, well, I'll give you $10 to go cut it, but then you're like, well, $10 is not worth my time, so you give it up, right? So it's the same thing here. Walmart, uh, Target wants a 12% return, but if faced with a 10% return, they basically say, okay, I don't want to do it. So they select zero instead. Now Walmart, if they go small, Target can either go 18 or zero, and 18 is beyond the threshold for Target of 12, so they will select to enter instead. All right. Now notice though that then Walmart can pick large or small, but then the two choices that Walmart can make are either 22 or 18, and they will select 22 because it's better for them in this case, and this will be the end result, making the assumption that target requires a 12% return. All right, so in game theory, the idea is that every game is an individual game, and you will be playing every game based on the rules that you have, the payoffs that you want, and you build your strategies based on those. So every game is slightly different. All right, let's go into the next PowerPoint. And let's play this game again. And again, without changes, so let's just play like this. All right, so Dale has the ability to pay this particular company. This is about contracts. So Dale can pay this company either 30 or 20 for something that they provide for Dale. Now notice that Tromich, which is a company that's here, it's going to either get 5,000 as a return, or they're, uh, sorry, 5 million, or they're going to make 2 million. And 5 million is better than 2. So given the choice of 30, they will go with accept. Now, given the choice of 20, they can either, again, accept or not accept. And notice that accept is still better than not accepting. So they will go with accept. 
as their answer. All right, now notice that once we know that this company is going to accept anything we're going to throw at them, then of course I'm going to throw them a lowball contract. So Dell is going to offer a lowball contract price for their product, and then TrueMatch is going to accept because 15 is better than 10 for Dell, so we're going to go with this. And this is my end result of this particular game. Dell goes with a low ball contract, Trollmatch accepts, and we end up in this as our end result or equilibrium. Now, when you're looking at game theory, um, you might be feeling like these companies can do whatever they want and then kind of like play with the customers. Um, this is true for most of the situations, but not pretty much all the time. Um, the, comp the industry is usually very competitive because you have other companies that are in the system also producing things. Uh, there's a potential entry by other people that may cause disruptions in your industry. There's also other substitute goods that can show up at any point in time and if you go like this one for example you can think about the transition in transportation in the world over the last let's call it a 500 years or so where if you wanted to go long distance 500 years ago you would take a ship and it would take forever eventually in the intercontinental sort of transportation we invented trains and then people then started using trains to go in the within a continent and then they were using uh, ships to go outside of the continent. Um, then we then fill up the space with lots and lots of roads. And with the roads came cars and buses and motorcycles and so on. And notice how today you can do a relatively long transportation, either using cars, buses, or something else, but you also have the choice of flying and so on. So as time goes by, there's always substitutes that pop in that may or may not be exactly in the same industry that you're in. Buyers are always going to be looking for a lower price. Suppliers are always going to be looking for a higher profit. Um, at this point, it's usually useful to talk about the bargaining power that companies have, like Walmart. Walmart is the largest retailer in the world. And one of the things that they have is that when they Oh, when they call somebody for a contract, they are so powerful that they can ch they can basically pay you a fairly low price for your supplied uh, contract to them. And that's one of the reasons why they can then transfer that lower price to the consumer. So the larger you are, the better you can bargain for prices. And Walmart has that, what we call market power. Now let's quickly do the oligopoly model. Um, as in vision. I don't really like to focus too much on the oligopoly model itself because I think that um, it doesn't explain lots and lots of uh, things that happen in reality. It does explain the issue of collusion, which is prevalent. So um, the oligopoly model uses what we call the kink demand curve. And the kink demand basically says that an oligopolist is sort of in between a monopolistically competitive company and a monopoly. And they will behave like either or, depending on whatever is best for them. And most of the time, they're sort of going to get together in this kink. Now, this kink um, is what gives you your collusion area. So the collusion on prices is going to happen at this kink on the demand. And this will be the quote unquote equilibrium price in this industry. And this will be the equilibrium quantity in this industry. Now the marginal revenue line for this market it's going to be a sort of split marginal revenue line.
All right, now again, I don't like to explain this model in too much detail because it really doesn't explain um, the behavior in real life um, most of the time. It does explain this collusion. Um, oligopoly behavior is easiest or most accurately explained using this sort of game theory behavior where each individual game needs to be taken separately. All right, that concludes our explanation for oligopoly. I hope you had a good time, and um, talk to you guys later.